So let's look at the first category of, prefer of irrationalities, that is irrational preferences. We're going to discuss a few ways in which our preferences can be irrational. Um, the first is the existence of what we call reference points in this anchoring phenomenon. This is a tendency for us to use available but totally irrelevant information when we're valuing something. Um, that is, if, for example, I just hand you a random number and then I ask you to place a value on something, it actually doesn't matter what the thing is, you're going to tend to be anchored to whatever that random number was that I gave you. Now we can actually see this being used against us by marketers uh, on a regular basis. Um, for example, if you watch infomercials, if you're like me when I was a kid, I'd get up in the morning, I'd go downstairs, get my bowl of Cheerios, and I'd watch infomercials. And what they always do is they give you a number of prices they're not going to charge you. And so they say, well, how much would you expect to pay for this food dehydrator? $200? Well, you're not going to pay $200. $150? Well, you're not going to pay $150. $130? Well, you're not going to pay $130. You're going to pay three easy payments of $29.99 or something like that. Right, so infomercials use this. So when they're giving you all of these various prices that they're not going to charge you, well, what's the point of that? that they're just really wasting their valuable infomercial time unless that puts a number in our head that makes us attach a certain value to the good. So if they tell us, how much would you expect to pay? 200? You might not think, well, yes, but you might think, well, something close to 200. Then when they offer you the actual deal, it feels like a wonderful deal because you have in mind a much higher number. A second thing that we see is when you go um, shopping in certain stores, um, they love to put compare prices on things. Um, one of my favorites is when I go shopping at DSW to get new shoes. Every single box has on it the, com the compare price and the DSW price. And inevitably, the compare price is going to be higher than the DSW price, but not by a whole lot. Now the problem is there's no evidence that anyone anywhere has ever paid that compare price. Instead it's just a totally irrelevant number that the store is feeding to us. But it changes our valuation of the good. That way, because our valuation gets anchored by that compare price, when we look at the DSW price, it looks much better. A second type of irrational preference is loss aversion, or what we call the endowment effect. When we talk about it as the endowment effect, here we mean that we value things more after we have them. So once it becomes part of my endowment, that it is something that I'm given, uh, then I tend to attach a lot of value to it. Uh, but before I have it, I don't necessarily put a lot of value on it. As a result, I don't necessarily go to a lot of effort to try to get something in the first place, but I will go to a lot of effort to keep from losing something. Um, this actually helps to explain such behavior. In the extreme case, we see things like hoarding happen, right, where after I have something, it's very difficult for me to part with it. Right, that's what we call loss aversion, this strong aversion um, to losing things. We strongly avoid trying to lose things, even though we wouldn't necessarily do very much to get them in the first place. Now, there's a great experiment that was run by behavioral economists studying this idea of loss aversion or the endowment effect. And what he did, um, he had people at a, um, at a sports card show, and so we have various vendors and various collectors going and buying and selling various sports cards, baseball cards, football cards, and the like. And what he did was he had a survey that they would fill out, and then he would randomly give them um, one of two cards that had roughly equal values. But then he'd give them the opportunity, if they wanted, to switch to the other card. Right, so he would give them one at random and say, oh, well, if you don't want that one, here's another one you could take. And what he found was that people tended to keep the one that they were given. Now, this um, is something that is actually... Uh, kind of unusual. And if these two things have equal values, we'd expect about half of people to switch to the other one based on, say, their own collection, their own preferences for the two cards. Uh, but it seems that people, after they're given a card, developed a very strong preference for keeping it. Now, one really interesting twist to this was that he found that people that are more experienced at the trading of sports cards um, tend to be less affected by loss aversion. That is, they're much more willing to give up what they have to get something else which is um, kind of an interesting thing. Um, he also did this uh, in order to, he also did this over time to look at exactly the same traders and see how their behavior changed. And he did actually find that as they gained more experience trading, they had uh, their loss aversion decrease. 
Now, some examples where we see this in everyday life, um, one would be the Netflix free, free trial month. This happened with my wife and I. My wife uh, thought it would be a good idea for us to get Netflix, but I had a hard time justifying what, at the time, was, uh, I believe, something like $10 a month. So I said, no, nah, I don't want to pay ten, eleven dollars a month for us to get Netflix. It's probably not worth it. But finally, my wife convinced me that, well, the free trial is certainly worth it, I, and we can see how we like it. And sure enough, after we had a, had it for a month, I was willing to pay eleven dollars. Now actually, I'm up to eighteen dollars um, to keep it. This is exactly a case of loss aversion, where I wasn't willing to do much to get the thing in the first place. In fact, they had to give it to me for free. Uh, but once I had it, I was very willing to pay to keep the thing. This also happens with investing in stocks, where there's a tendency for people to hold on to stocks too long, especially if they've started losing money. People are extremely loss averse, and, and they feel like, well, if they just hold on a little longer, things are going to turn around. Now, this may or may not be true, it ends up. And, and often, your best course when you're investing in stocks is to buy the best investment available, not to just hold on to something where things are not going well and just pray that they turn around. Another type of irrational preference is self-control issues. These are really nothing surprising to most people. Um, that is just that we treat now as being very special. There's a huge difference between now and a day from now. Well, there may not be a huge difference between a week from now and a week and a day from now. Right? So we treat, say, for example, waiting a week or waiting a day differently if that starts now than if it starts later. Right? So I'm very willing, if I already have to wait a month, to wait an extra day or two for something is not a big deal. But waiting a day or two from right now feels like a very big deal. Some examples of this that we see, um, one is Christmas accounts. Christmas accounts are a wonderful example um, related to self-control issues, where we know that we have self-control issues, and it ends up that knowledge affects our behavior. So we do things like invest in Christmas accounts. What a Christmas account is, um, often banks or credit unions will have these, where you put money in it over the course of the year, and then come Christmas season, that money is released to you, so you can go and you can spend it uh, on buying Christmas gifts, is really the idea. Now, the trick with Christmas accounts is that they're very illiquid. It's, it's relatively difficult to get your money out before Christmas season. Um, another thing is that they don't usually pay very good interest, uh, often worse than a standard savings account. So this is a case where you're actually giving up money to make your money less available to yourself. Now, this wouldn't make sense if we were all rational. On the other hand, if we know that we have self-control issues, then this is really a way for us to help us control ourselves. And with diets, we can do a very similar thing with, say, taking the fridge and putting it in the basement, right? Making it more inconvenient for us to do what we know we shouldn't. Or in my case, um, I've just found that my family shouldn't buy potato chips. So we almost never buy potato chips because it ends up, for me, it doesn't matter how big the bag is, it's a single serving. Because I know I have that self-control issue, we don't buy potato chips. A last type of irrational preference is the failure of transitivity. This is where we just see a reversal in preferences. So that is, sometimes people choose an apple over a banana, then given the choice between a banana and a carrot, they take the banana. So we would think they should choose the apple over the carrot. But then given the choice between those two, they pick the carrot. That is, their preferences have reversed over the course of this. So transitivity failed. Now in experiments, we find this is especially likely when we deal with some kind of uncertainty. So say you have people value different lottery tickets, and then when you ask them to choose between them, they often reverse them from the order in which they ha had originally valued them. Now some examples of this, well, to be perfectly honest, I don't know that there are really interesting ones other than the fact that people seem to change their minds about things. This is another case where we do see in the lab that people do have reversals and preferences, which is not something that would be predicted by the mainstream notion of rationality.